So my name is Tim, and I am an elder here. If you are a guest with us this morning, let me give you a very warm welcome. We are glad to see you. We're glad you're here. We're glad you've come to join us uh, for this celebration. So again, like I said, this is going to look a little different than usual. If um, you know, if if you've been coming here regularly, you'll notice that we didn't have a gathering song this morning. So this Sunday being a little different, all of the kids. Uh, are going to be up here with us for the start of the service after a special VBS presentation in just a few uh, minutes or two. Um, we'll go on, and after that presentation, the preschoolers will go back downstairs, but the elementary schoolers will stay up here with us. Again, if you're a guest, we do have restrooms available downstairs. Um, they're down the stairs on the, on the right of the hallway. That's right underneath us, and uh, after, uh, I don't know, I've been looking forward to this, after we're going to have a free cookout, it'll be burgers and dogs and all of those sort of things, and, and we're just going to enjoy and celebrate uh, the end of our VBS, but also at that time, all the kids are going to perform all the songs that they learned during VBS, so we will have an outdoor uh, exhibition at that point. So as Bill Winter is going to come to open our time of worship in prayer, let's hear our scripture reading this morning from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 through 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to uh, come together as a church family uh, this morning uh, to worship you, to, um, to celebrate uh, the VBS that we had this week and, and uh, enjoy um, with the kids uh, the fun that they were able to have, uh, to enjoy the, the learning that they had. Um, and Father, I just uh, thank you for that opportunity uh, I thank you for, for just who you are, for the, the ways that you show us every day who you are, uh, for the, the small glimpses of, of your power that we see, and, and just the thunder and lightning that we had this week, and, uh, and, and just sensing the, the power behind that and understanding that uh, it, it's just such a small glimpse of, of the total power that you have. Uh, and I thank you just that uh, as the Psalms say that uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and as the VBS verse says that uh, we are his workmanship, that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And uh, I, I thank you that, that you have made us uh, in, in your image uh, and <clears throat> made us to, to be representatives of you. Uh, Father, I, I know that we so often fail, though, uh, and uh, we fail in so many ways. We fail daily, hourly, minute. By, minute by minute even. Uh, and Father, I, I'm so thankful that you, you sent your son to save us, that uh, you sent the creator and sustainer of the world to come and die for us. Uh, and uh, that even though uh, we are sinful people uh, that, that regularly choose to uh, not follow you, that uh, you still love us so much that uh, you would sacrifice your only son for us. And Father, I uh, just pray that you would help us to be able to join together in worship today uh, and enjoy with the kids, uh, maybe let loose a little bit as uh, we can just uh, witness the kids having fun and uh, just remember that uh, we should have that uh, childlike heart in ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with me if you're able as we begin our time of worship together.
singing. You can be seated. At this time, we would like to invite the children, the VBS kids, up. We're going to do the Spark Studio song, so come on up. If you were part of VBS this last week and you know the Spark Studio song, come on up. We're going to do it. Wait, don't go anywhere. Y'all take a seat right here. Everybody, if we haven't met yet, my name is Cornelius, and I had the privilege of spending the past week at Spark Studios with these and about 25 other fantastic kids. How have y'all been? I've missed you so much. It's been like a day and a half. I'm sure you all just slept all day yesterday because you were so tired, right? No! No! Oh, my goodness. Well, friends... We have a lot of people here today who didn't join us at Spark Studios, so I figured we could teach them our motto and memory verse before we talk a little bit about what today is going to look like. Does that sound good? All right, so can you help me with our motto that we are created, designed, empowered? And you all got a taste of it during the song, but our memory verse is Ephesians 2.10. Y'all ready for this? For we are His workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Ephesians 2.10. Great job. Raise your hand if you memorized that verse this week and got a prize. We had so many kids memorize this verse. It was incredible. I am so proud of all of you. You can put your hands down. That's great. All right, friends. A couple of things about what today is going to look like. 
if you are one of our preschoolers. So two, three, four. Uh, after we have our offering, when we give money to the BMI Christian School and to the church to keep God's work going, you are going to go downstairs. But if you are in kindergarten through fifth grade, you're going to stay up here. So I have these awesome little worship packets for you to help during the sermon. So let me walk you through what these look like. We've got on the first page the passage of Scripture we're going to read. This is for you to keep. So you mark it up. You circle something. What's that word mean? Hey, I know what that is. That sounds like another verse. You write all over it, whatever you want. The next is fill in the blank. So while the sermon is going, look on the screen and see if you can fill in every blank. Beyond that, we've got a crossword, we've got a word search, and we've got a coloring page. It is Spark Studios after all. So before you leave the front of the room, make sure you grab a packet and a bag of crayons. Y'all, it is so good to see you, and I cannot wait to keep worshiping Jesus with you this morning. We're going to do something a little bit different than we usually do. Each night at VBS, we collected money for the BMI Christian School in Liberia. And remember, we had our super awesome mega missions goal that uh, if we hit it, something happened. And I always forget... That's right, you get to pie me in the face. And we came just shy of our mission's goal. But you have one more opportunity. So in just a minute, I'm going to pray, and then here's what's going to happen. You all are going to go back to your seats. If you have brought any money to give to missions or to the church, that's what those wooden baskets are for, we'll do that. So we'll do our offering in just a minute, BBC. Missions to BMI, regular offering to the sides. We also have that wooden box in the back. After that, Miss Laura Bell is going to read from the Bible, and then Pastor Jeremy is going to pray for us, and we'll keep our worship going. But my friends, I am so glad to see you, and I cannot wait to worship with you, and then eat with you, and then throw a pie in your face. I mean, you, you, throw, you throw a pie in my face. That's right. All right, so can we pray together? All right, let's pray in three, two, one. God, thank you so much for my friends and bringing, bringing them back here to worship you together now. Lord, we lift up this time of giving to you that you would be honored by it and glorified in it and that you would use these monies to advance your kingdom, that you would be with the boys and girls at BMI in Liberia and that you would be with the boys and girls here in Burtonsville as we seek to love you in all ways. God, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, friends, before you go back to your seat, make sure you grab a packet, grab some crayons, and then Miss. Bonnie will play some light music while we do our time of giving. If you have anything for the BMI offering, put it in the green bucket. If you have anything for the church, the brown baskets. Make sure you grab a packet. Revelation 4, 8 through 11. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. 
they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let's pray together for church family. Dear Heavenly Father, you are holy, holy, holy. That is how you are described by the angelic host that surrounds you. And Lord God, you are also merciful in sending Christ to die for us, that we might be reconciled to you, a holy God. What an amazing thing that is, Lord God, and I pray that you would help us to further grow in the knowledge and understanding of your holiness, our own sinfulness, and the the beauty of the redemption that is available through Christ Jesus. And Lord God, I pray that we would proclaim that great truth here in Burtonsville and um, across the world and um, even in our own hearts, Lord. Father God, we want to pray for our church family this morning. We want to lift up the children here at BBC, just praising you and rejoicing, rejoicing for this wonderful VBS that we were able to, to host this week. Lord God, we pray for much gospel fruit to come from that. Father, we pray that the seed sown in these children's hearts would grow and develop into a faithful walk with the Lord Jesus. Um, that others would hear of who you are because of, of even what you're doing in the lives of these young children. We pray that they will continue to grow and develop into men and women who would love and proclaim the name of Christ. Lord God, we want to pray for our church deacons here, praying that you would um, just bless them and, and praying with thanksgiving for the work that they do. Um, just so many things that need to happen behind the scenes um, that they do thank, do tirelessly um, that this church might operate and function and that your name will be glorified through even their, um, their, their works in the, the sort of more ordinary tasks of the church. Lord God, we pray that you bless them, that you work through them for your glory, um, that your name would be glorified. Lord God, we want to pray for our evangelism opportunities. We pray that um, as we have opportunities to interact with those here who are visitors for, for, um, for VBS and, and, and others that we see in the community, that we would have the opportunity to share the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Lord God, may we point people to um, the one who is able to set them free from sin's hold. Um, Lord God, we just pray that whatever... We know ultimately that it's only by your spirit that anyone comes to faith. Um, and Lord God, we pray that you would help us be faithful with our, um, with our opportunities, with those we interact with, and that we would be um, just bold in our proclamation of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also want to pray for other churches in the area. We want to pray and lift up um, New Covenant Baptist Church and Pastor James Choi and Apindo International Church and Pastor James Ngigi. Um, Father, we pray for these congregations that your word would transform them. We pray for the preaching and the, the hearing of the gospel there, that it would accomplish the purpose that you have for it. Um, we just pray that you continue to grow them deep in, 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 in Christ, uh, that he would be the source and, and the, um, the beginning and the end of their lives, Father. Lord, we want to pray for our governments as well, Father. We want to pray for our um, legislative branch locally here and at the state level and even in Congress as they seek to make laws. We pray that they would do so recognizing that ultimately they will answer to you for how they govern um, the laws that they make. We pray that by your grace they would be just, that they would reflect your character here in, in our country and in our county and in our state. Um, And we thank you for these men and women who work tirelessly to try to see um, our laws properly um, operate our society. But we we just ask for you to be gracious in working in their hearts that their, their motives would align with your motive, Father. 
And we also want to lift up uh, the Betty Memorial Institute um, and Pastor Varney Freeman there, and we just thank you for um, the work that they've been doing. It's been such a privilege to see your faithfulness at that school. Um, we pray that the missions offering that we were able to collect here would, would be used to continue growing the work that you're doing there. Um, we just pray for those kids. Pray that you would bless them and keep them and make your face to shine upon them, Father. May they know the Lord Jesus and follow him all the days of their lives. And we want to pray for the country of South Korea. We want to pray that you would continue to um, work in that, in that um, country. We recognize that there are many faithful churches there. We pray that you would work through those churches to continue your work. Um, that, that people who do not know the Lord Jesus would come to know him through the faithful testimony of the local churches there. We pray for those who are um, just serving in those places that they would be faithful to the gospel, Father. And in all these things, we want to thank you, Father. We know that you are the, um, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, and we owe all things to you. And, and, and it's such a privilege we have to be able to worship you together. Um, and Lord, I, God, I, I pray that as we, we continue our worship gathering, we would just recognize what an awesome opportunity we have to put our, um, to give the, your name the praise that it's due. Uh, we thank you for this time together and pray that you would bless it for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Stand again if you're able as we continue our service of worship together.
Thank you again for excellent singing. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It's nice to see you. I haven't seen you yet this morning. I heard you saw someone else, but certainly wasn't me. That's so just a few words for those who might have been coming in. We have children's packets available. If you did not get one, find someone in a purple shirt. And if they don't have one, they'll find someone in a purple shirt, and eventually you'll get one. In that packet are a number of things that kids are welcome to do while uh, the sermon is ongoing. We've got the whole text that we're going to look at, Psalm 8. Friends, the first thing I do every week as I'm preparing to preach is I print out the passage, and I scribble all over it. I mark it up. I put big question marks. I underline. I star. I highlight feel free to do the same. Then there's a fill in the blank, some word search, crossword puzzle, coloring sheets, all things. Um, This is by no means a you must stay seated. We've got room in the back to walk around. We've even got rooms in the back that you can walk around in. Restrooms are downstairs. Y'all just make yourselves at home and we'll have fun together. So 13 years ago, uh, before some of you were born, I was but a college student And I got a summer job at a semi-professional tennis team in D.C., the Washington Castles, with a K. I I did a bit of everything for them. I would do setup, breakdown, mascotting. Um, But one one of the main things I did each week was take care of the guest stars. They would have kind of semi-professional tennis players, but each week there would be one or two, like, professional tennis players. And the most famous that we had were Venus and Serena Williams. And so one Saturday in July of 2009, that's weird to say, uh, it was my job to take care of two of the greatest tennis players in history, Venus and Serena. And so if they wanted the schedule, I was on it. If they wanted it three degrees cooler in their room, I made it happen. If they wanted pink Powerade, I tried my best. So here's the deal. At least one of them had some sort of big sponsorship with Powerade. So it couldn't just be any sports drink. It had to be Powerade. And I was told, pink. And so as I'm going more and more frantically through every convenience and grocery store in the city, I'm realizing I can't find pink Powerade. I don't even know if they exist. And so I did what I thought was best. I got a red one and a blue one, hoped that purple was close enough, said sorry, and then ran away. (laughs) They're very tall. Like, very tall. It was a surreal experience, um, getting to spend an afternoon with two of the greatest tennis players to ever live. Um, Here's a question for you. What are the chances either of them remember any part of that day? Do you think in their incredibly important and very exciting lives, they have ever once stopped to reflect on that time that weird guy messed up their drink order before a charity event? My guess is not. I'm thinking I'm of no consequence in their lives. It's a bit of an extreme example, but I think the principle holds true for us in many aspects. We work incredibly hard on a big project, either at school or at the office, and then our teacher or our boss or our boss's boss totally overlooks our contribution. You spend hours handcrafting a balanced, healthy, accessible dinner for your children, and they reject it again for dino chicken nuggets. Can I get an amen from any parents or just... Okay, thank... I appreciate that. Uh, You hit it off with someone that you just met and you're connecting with them and you're having a great conversation. You go your separate ways and then after a time you come back together and you can't wait to see them and pick up where you left off and they hit you with the... Oh, it's nice to meet you. What is your name? We all want... We all want recognition particularly if it's from someone in a position of power. We want to be noticed. We want to be valued. We want to be seen. But all too often we go entirely unnoticed and occasionally wonder if we will ever, in fact, make a difference. To address such thoughts, let me invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 8. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a red one under the seat in front of you. Here's a fun trick I like to do for the Psalms. You kind of take your Bible and open it right about halfway. Boom. And you should be pretty close to the Psalms. If you're not, just turn to the left. And if you see on the top left or the top right of your Bible that word Psalm, it starts with a P. That P is sneaky. You'll see the word Psalm and then a number. We're looking just for the number 8. That's the Psalm that we're going to be looking at today. And then, friends, if you do not have a Bible for your own, please 
take one of those red ones as a gift for you. We love giving away copies of God's Word. By all means, take that and read from it. Psalm 8 centers on the recognition that we humans receive from the one in the ultimate position of power. It's going to extol God's glory to the highest of heights and then say that this God, the sovereign king and creator of everything, recognizes us, loves us, crowns us with glory and honor, and rescues us from evil. Ultimately, we'll see this morning, and here's your main point for those filling in the blanks, God reveals his majesty in creation, humanity, and his silencing evil. So we're going to read this psalm, look at each of those three ways God reveals his majesty, but first let's pray together, then we'll read. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful to be in your presence, to be in a privileged position to read your word. Lord, please open our ears, open our hearts, speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Psalm 8, to the choir master, according to the Gittith, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8 is the first song of praise in all of the psalms. There's 150 of them total. This is the first psalm of praise. And it's actually the first part of God's word that made it to the moon. So astronauts on the Apollo 11 mission brought a copy of Psalm 8 and left it on the lunar surface. So if you ever find yourself on the moon, look down, see if you can find Psalm 8. Let me know, I'd be interested to hear it. Psalm 8 gives us a stunning view of both God and us. So it's my prayer that we leave here today with a bigger view of God and a better understanding of ourselves. So let's start back in verse 1 with God reveals his majesty. So this is kind of setting the stage. Look at verse 1 with me. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, that's not the only time we see that in this passage. It's also at the very end of it in verse 9. That's what we call in fancy literary language an inclusio. What does that mean? Well, that's just a way to say that when you put the same thing at the beginning and the end of a passage, it emphasizes that that is the main thing. So whatever else we talk about in this psalm, that is the main point. It's all about God and his majesty. So let's look at this important point. I'm curious if you picked up on that slight difference in how God is addressed. O Lord, our Lord. Look closely. The first Lord, all capital letters. The second one, only capital L. What's that about? Well, these are two different names for God. The first one, all caps, Lord, is God's covenant personal name. It's Yahweh. It's what he revealed to Moses at the burning bush. It means, I am who I am. And so it speaks not only to God's special relationship with his people, but to his character, who he is. And then that second Lord, just the capital L, Hebrew for that is Adonai. That speaks to God as the king, the ruler, the one in charge of it all. So with these two names, we get a picture of who God is, and what he does. Who he is, he's the never-changing, same yesterday, today, and forever God of all. And what he does, well, he's the king, Adonai, ruler of all. So it's no wonder that his name is majestic in all the earth. Now, there, describing the majesty of God's name is exactly the same as describing God's majesty. You see, God's name is how he reveals himself to us. His name represents him. It's a it's similar to what we do with our signatures. So when we sign something, whether it's a receipt or a mortgage or anything, it's a way of committing ourselves to it via our name. Back in Exodus 34, Moses is with God on the mountaintop, and Moses asks God, show me your glory. Well, here's how God does it in Exodus 34:5. The Lord descended in the cloud 
and stood with him there, this is Moses, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. That's how God revealed his glory. Here, his glory, his majesty, his majestic name is revealed in all the earth. And our psalmist here, David, uses that to frame everything else that we're going to see. So if you were to see this passage through a pair of glasses, verse 1 and verse 9 would be the two lenses of those glasses. So let's break down the middle part of this psalm, looking at how God's majesty is revealed in creation, humanity, and God silencing evil. So, first, God reveals his majesty in creation. Look at the second part of verse 1. You have set your glory above the heavens. And then verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what's man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? We're going to get to verse 4 in a minute, so hang on to that. But let's think about how God reveals his majesty in creation. You know, as I was preparing this week, it was super providential timing of the Lord that the James Webb Space Telescope just released its first images. And I, were we able to have some? Oh, look, there you go. So this is like the Hubble telescope, but better and newer in every way. It is incredible to think about what it is that God created. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. That's Psalm 19.1. He has indeed set his glory above the heavens. I mean, goodness, just the sheer scope of the universe should be all that we need to understand that God has revealed his majesty in creation. Here's some thought experiments for you. Did you know that you can fit every single planet in our solar system in between the Earth and the moon? You can. If the Earth were the size of a grain of sand, then to scale, the sun would be about the size of a pool ball and would be roughly 20 feet away from it. The nearest star besides our sun would be about a thousand miles away. That's if we were to take a road trip from here to Miami. And then our Milky Way galaxy, the one in which we reside, if the Earth was a grain of sand and the sun was a pool ball, our galaxy would be roughly 29 million miles wide. That's how far the Earth and Mars are in real life. And yet, with all that in mind, did you catch how God created the heavens? Look at verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers. Everything that exists is the work of God's fingers. Not his whole person, not even his arm or his hand, his fingers. What does that say about God? And, and, and what does that say about creation? Well, first it says that God is majestic that he used but his fingers to create the entire universe from incomprehensibly large galaxies down to incredibly intricate molecules that make up you and me. God made it all with his fingers. And so, if that's who God is, well then, friends, he is not someone that you invite into your life. You don't say, well, you know, sure, I could use some God right about now. I'll try this whole following Jesus thing. No, 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 no. We are to bow down before this God, lay our lives at his feet for the privilege of being called his own. Because he is the one who made all that is with his fingers. Which means, now looking at what that means for creation, creation is his work of art. I mean, just think about what we do with our fingers. We paint and sculpt and knit and design. We create art with them. And that's what God has done in creation. If you were here for VBS, you saw that away, some just stunning sunsets as we were rolling out, especially on Tuesday after the storms. My word. My favorite Ziggy cartoon, which is a throwback for some of you, if you know what I'm talking about, then praise God for that. My favorite Ziggy cartoon is one where he's just standing on a cliffside looking at a beautiful sunset, and he's just clapping, saying, Go, God. Every aspect of creation points to who God is. Just like how all great art reveals a bit of their artist, so too does the fact that we have a beautifully designed world. Now let me be clear. There is no substitute for the special revelation of God's Word. We learn all that we need to know about God through this book. But at the same time, let us not neglect the classroom of creation and the general revelation that the created order reveals about our God. 
God's majesty is revealed in creation. It's also revealed, second, in humanity. Go back to verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man, us, humanity, that you, God, are mindful of him, that you, the Son of Man, that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. So David is going to sharp turn from creation to humanity. It, he's just shown us how big and great and majestic God is in light of all he's made. And so then, what in the world are we? We fleeting specks on one planet, in one solar system, in one galaxy. Why would God... Be mindful of and care for us. Well, David answers this question by, by doubling down on the audacity of it all, because not only is God mindful of humanity, not only does he care for us, he made us only a little lower than the heavenly beings, and he crowned us with glory and honor and dominion over the works of his hands. He's, he's put all things under his feet. And then we take a trip to the zoo in verse 7. Sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the heaven, fish, all that pass along the paths of the sea. So why? Why has God done this? How can he have done this? It's easy to understand why David's marveling at it all. I mean, I couldn't get two tennis players to notice me beyond fetching drink orders for them. And yet here we have the Lord of all, not just noticing us, but being mindful of us, thinking of us, considering us, remembering us, caring for us. And the reason for all this is found in verse 5 and how he made us. You see, Psalm 8 here uses Genesis 1 and 2. That's on the very first page of your Bible. That's how this whole thing gets started. And so let me read just a, a verse or two from that beginning to help fill it out. Here's Genesis 1:26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish and the birds and the livestock. And then verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the reason we have glory and honor and dominion over the rest of creation is because we bear God's image. Now, friends, that is incredibly important for us to remember that our value, our worth, our dignity isn't in how fast we can run, how much money we make, how smart we are, how stylish our clothes are. Our value is in being made in God's image, and nothing can change that. And as God has given us his image, as he's bestowed that on us, he's revealed his majesty. Two, two ways. For, for now. First, God reveals his majesty in giving us his image in that you can only give what you already have. So if you come up to me and say, hey, Brian, can I get a million dollars? I will say, not a chance, because I don't have a million dollars. If you've never seen a check bounce, that'd be a fun way for you to explore that part of life. I can't give it because I don't have it. God is able to give majesty and glory and dominion to us because he already has it all. He has glory and honor and dominion, and so he can give these things to us, elevating we who would otherwise be just skin and bones to the pinnacle of creation, the, the crown jewel of all that he's made, the chief revelation of his majesty in the world. And then the second way that we, God's image bearers, reveal his majesty is in what he does with us. Verse 4, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? I don't know if anybody's got a King James Bible. We usually use the ESV. Not that the King James is bad. There's lots of good Bible versions. But here's something that the King James does with this that I think is really interesting and matches exactly the original language. It translates the end of that, the Son of Man, that you visit him, which is what the word means. God attends to us. He cares for us. He visits us. But that raises more questions. Well, how does God, the one who made everything with his fingers, how does he visit us? Well, that leads to our third revelation of God's majesty, his silencing evil. We'll finish with verse 2. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Now, don't you go thinking Captain America and Iron Man on me. These Avengers are not good. These are bad Avengers. You could really call them Revengers because they're people who hold grudges and take revenge. It's like 
Cain and Lamech in Genesis 4. Um, But both Avengers and the enemy are stilled and silenced here by God's strength. But then it gets a little topsy-turvy. God's strength established out of the mouth of babies and infants. Friends, we live in a a broken, fallen, sin-stained, evil world, and I don't know the particularities of how that has affected you, what evils you've endured, what hardship has found you, what enemies have come upon you, but I'm going to venture a guess that you've not been able to overcome them through the words, or maybe better, babble of babies and infants. Is it cute? Absolutely. Able to make just about anybody smile? 100%. A toddler gives you a toy phone? I don't care who you are. You're answering that phone. But capable of silencing evil? Well, that's another story. But it's a story that reveals God's majesty as he doesn't need great strength or Herculean effort or strategizing and planning to silence evil. He can do it out of the mouths of babies and infants. That's just the sort of thing he does all the time. Here's, here's some verses to show that. James 2, 5. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? 1 Corinthians 1, 27. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And he does this in the ultimate example of him visiting humanity. The way he silences evil in the sending of His Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. God sent Him not as a mighty warrior ready to defeat evil by force from day one. He sent Jesus as a baby, weak, helpless. And then as Jesus grew, He shunned the path of power and prestige. Even when He, the Son of God, came into His royal city, Jerusalem, do you remember how He did it? My VBS friends, this was our Wednesday night story. You shouted out, what animal did Jesus ride into Jerusalem? A donkey, not a war horse surrounded by thousands of soldiers ready to take the city by force. On a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the people who surrounded him, they weren't the, the powerful, the movers and shakers. They were the least of these. They were effectively the babies and the infants. They were the ones crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so then Jesus and the crowds, they go into the temple itself, and by that point, those people who are in power, they're looking down their noses and be like, who's this guy on this donkey surrounded by these people? And so they indignantly, ugh, they indignantly ask Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? And here's Jesus' response, Matthew 21, 16. Yes. Have you not read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? He quotes our psalm. He quotes verse 2 right here, and in doing so, applies it to himself. So let me try to tie all these pieces together as we wrap up. Jesus is the way God silences evil. He is the strength of the Lord, established even out of the mouth of babies and infants, able to still and overcome the enemy and the avenger. Now, when connecting this psalm to Jesus, maybe if you've studied your Bible a bit, you recognize that that son of man language in verse 4 is often connected to Jesus. That's what the author of Hebrews does with this whole psalm. You can read Hebrews 2, 5 to 18. We're not going to go there now, but that would be a wonderful experiment for you to try this week. Look up Hebrews 2, 5 to 18, and read that in light of this psalm. And if you would be willing to, let me know what you find, because there's so much there, and it's all fascinating. Jesus is the Son of Man. He is the perfect image of the invisible God who came to us, who who visited us, who cared for us and was mindful of us to such an extent that he died for us on the cross, which is the greatest thing ever to happen for us because each of us has failed to live out the glory, honor, and dominion God gave us as was intended. We haven't been good stewards of creation. We've been selfish and greedy. We've failed to love our fellow image bearers, one another, as ourselves. We've all, every one of us, sinned. And so that evil, the the enemy and the avenger that we read about, that's not just out there. It's in here as well. It's in our hearts. But God, the one who made all things with his fingers, was able to silence even that evil through the victorious death of Jesus. Now, what? victorious death. What in the world? Yes, 
because Jesus' death was in our place for our sins. And that victory that Jesus paid our penalty was confirmed because Jesus didn't stay dead. On the third day, God raised him to new life, showing that he has victory over sin and death and has granted us that same new life that we too can be cleansed from sin, restored to the right rule over the world that he has given us. And so now in Jesus, truly are all things put under our feet. No longer need the things of this world to to rise above their proper place. Have you ever felt that? That there's something in your life that you care about just too much? And you know that you shouldn't. It's just a game. It shouldn't matter what 22 dudes on a pitch of grass do with a ball, but I feel it in my heart. It's just a new car. I shouldn't be this concerned. It's just a new game. It's just a... But we feel it, don't we? Well, the way to keep the things of this world under our feet and not on top of our hearts is through Jesus. Friends, there is no greater revelation of the majesty of God than his silencing of evil through Jesus, which means there's no better way for us to recognize and appreciate God's majesty than by giving our lives to Jesus, looking to him and him alone for salvation, acceptance, and life. In his great majesty, God has crowned us with glory and honor and has given us dominion over the works of his hands. But in our sin, we rebelled against him and used that glory and honor for ourselves, not for him. But in Christ, we're redeemed, restored, rescued. Let me ask you a few questions. This is it. Would you turn from and repent of your sin? Would you turn to Jesus and receive his gift of salvation today? And if not, what would keep you from doing so? That's a sincere, genuine question. You would make my day if you wanted to grab me at that barbecue and say, here's why not. I would love to talk with you about that. Because the God whose majesty exceeds even the highest heavens has created you as his image bearer. And despite your sin, he loves you so much that he provided you a way to him through Jesus. So how will you respond to him? Here's a few suggestions from a great old hymn. Majesty. Worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom, authority flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raised. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty. Worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Pray with me. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We see it on every starlit night, every sunset, every sunrise, every trip to the beach, every sight of the autumn leaves, every crisp, snowy winter morning. And yet you love us. You see us. You care for us. You visit us. You save us, God. We thank you for all that you are and all that you've done and the hope that we have because of you. God, break our hearts for the way that we've rebelled against you, that we've failed to to do what you've called us to do. And then fill us with your spirit that we might live the way you would have us to live so that we can please you, knowing that you only have what is best for us at heart. God, help us see the only way out of our sin is Jesus. So may we run to him and cling to him, for you have called us to him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please stand with me as we close our service together with a song.
times of waiting, times of need. When I know loss, when I am weak, I know his grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. My friends, if what we just sang is not true for you, if the Lord is not yet your salvation, or if you don't really know what that means, like, that's a weird sentence, Brian. Why do we grab someone in a purple shirt? You would make their day to say, hey, what, what does that actually mean? Help me understand it. I kind of fell asleep during the sermon. Help me out. No judgment at all. I do it sometimes, too. It gets a little embarrassing, but it's fine. Friends, Jesus is the reason we're here. Jesus is the reason we spent this last week, at least some of us, acting a fool, dressing up this place to look how it did. It's all because of him. So if you want to know who this person is and how he can make such a difference for so many people, again, you'd make our day to talk more about it. Uh, Y'all, food's just about ready. So by all means, hang out in here. It's cool in here. It's toasty out there, but that's fine. Make your way outside. We will eat. We will fellowship. We will have fun. But will we have pie in the face? That is the question. Let's see where we're at. Oh, wow! We crushed it! All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our goal which means a certain Cornelius is going to have to get his outfit ready for some pie. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read our benediction passage. I'll pray over the meal, so that way when y'all get outside, you just get to eating. 
We'll pie, we'll sing, there's a moon bounce. We're going to have a great afternoon. God bless you all. Hear this word from Romans 11. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Father, please bless this time of fellowship. Keep us safe and let us have a wonderful, glorifying to you time outside. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.